like to introduce Paul Hayden, Managing Director of Avista Partners. I don't actually understand exactly what you're talking about. I've read the description and I looked it up on the internet, but I said to myself, gosh, I better go listen to what this guy has to say because it sounds complicated but very interesting. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Paul, okay. and uh, let you tell us about dual track fundraising. Thank you. Is this microphone on? Yeah, I guess so. So to sum up what I'm going to talk about is that, you know, it's, it's very easy for um, a company entrepreneur to decide that he's got many roads to go down, many strategic options to consider. Um, and you, what I'm going to talk about is that you don't necessarily have to go down one road. You can go down multiple roads at the same time and, and actually have a better result at the end of the day, which is what it's all about. That's the simplest way to put, to put it. So who am I? I'm an advisor and investor. I've been based in London for 14 years. I've advised companies in transactions over a billion dollars. Um, companies I've recently worked with, Unity and Play Jam. I'm also a shareholder in those companies, plus Supercell, Gray Area, and Boom Lagoon. This is broadly what I'm going to talk about, to, about today. It's strategic options, some details about that, and then the dual track process and then a bit about strategics. So, let's talk about what. You know, your options at any point in time in your company are status quo, you know, business as usual, or material change. One where you're gonna grow via acquisitions or joint ventures, you're gonna raise some growth capital, or you're gonna sell some secondary shares to give liquidity to your shareholders, and that's gonna come from financial and or strategic investors or sell the company. And I'm not talking about the other options, shutting down when things don't go well. So status quo. Um, so I'm just going to look at sort of quickly advantages, disadvantages of all, all those options. The status quo, you know, it's, it's a pretty easy option. It's not much disruption, stable management, you know, assuming that you hit your business plans, everything's okay. The problem is, is that it's not always easy to grow fast or to keep growing fast. Um, disadvantages are that, you know, it's, it's going to require more management, more resources over time. I mean, the bigger you are, the bigger team you have, the more capital you need. And, you know, for those uh, that, you know, if you take a high level view of what's happening in the game sector, it's becoming more competitive um, every day. You know, there's some new mobile game company. And, you know, you could become or stay just a small fish in a large pond. So, given that it's an increasingly competitive game sector, it's, you're better to look at doing something versus just status quo. So, acquisitions and JVs. Why do it? You know, you can achieve critical mass. You can get synergies and cost savings. You can get shared know-how. You know, if you go and acquire, you know, someone who has um, complementary games or skill sets to yours, like a developer or publisher, you can grow your business very quickly and, and see additional margins. Um, if you're not a big company, then it's going to, it might be more difficult because some targets just want to sell the big companies. Disadvantages are, yeah, it's, it's going to require more management, more resources. And the big issue is that it's, it's pretty complex. Uh, it's not for everybody, uh, but you can achieve strong value creation. I'm going to zip through this very quick, because as you know, I've got 20 minutes. So growth capital secondary round, why do it? Um, share the increasing market risk. I mean, if you're, ha if you're having success, um, you know, there's no guarantee of the future, and having, being able to take away some of the risk is important. Management continuity with less disruption. Um, if you're bringing in investors where someone's going to join the board, ideally they can bring some value out beyond the money. Um, it can increase your capacity to grow your business organically or by acquisition. Basically, it's going to help you grow faster. Um, current shareholders can see some liquidity on their shares. Believe me, if you become very successful, um, your shareholders are going to want liquidity in their shares if you don't plan to sell the company in the near future. And the biggest thing is just make sure if you go down this route that you get a best fit with the, with the right type of people in terms of personalities, because you're, you're literally jumping in bed with those people. 
Disadvantages, you know, the term sheet and the new shareholders agreement is going to talk about some control issues which might come up depending on how much you're selling. You're going to have a more complicated ownership structure and you're not going to get a control premium. But it's an attractive option. Um, it's one that should always be considered. Selling the company, why do this? You can lock in 100% of the current value, uh, particularly for all cash deal, and you get a control premium. New owners should basically bring the, the value add to help grow faster rather than staying independent, plus more working capital. Plus you're going to have the synergies and cost savings. Um, timing is everything. If you try to sell too early, then you might not realize enough value. If you look to sell too late because the market's changed, and you may end up seeing a lot of loss value, or none at all for that matter. But you, you got to make sure you do your due diligence on who's buying you, particularly if there's going to be an earn out of share, uh, shares that you're taking as part of the deal. Disadvantages, you give up your independence. You're going to be working for a new owner, a bigger company, and the earn out structure and timing is key. I mean, you, you don't want to be taking an earn out that's paid out over six years. Assessment, this is a, actually the best one to do if founders just aren't comfortable with, you know, the ongoing risk of, of the business. Uh, the view is that, you know, the valuation of the company is not going to get that much bigger. Um, so just to throw in a few data points, um, just and hearing from the last panel. So yes, in 2011 there was over $2 billion raised. Um, mainly from VCs in the game sector. And last year there was only 1.2. So that is a big drop. Mind you, if you take out Zynga's $500 million uh, deal in 2011 before they did their IPO, then there's only 1.6 in 2011, so the drop is not as big. But 10 billion raised since 97. So on the other side, you've got your exits and IPOs. There's been $44 billion of value created. You know, that's, a, that's a number you want to share with investors of why they should invest in the sector. Uh, that's the amount of, that's been create, of value that's been created for venture capital, private equity, investors, and founders. Uh, 2011 was a particularly big year, primarily because of Nexon and Zynga's IPO, because that was the value at, at IPO, and obviously that's changed. So, Given these options, how do you choose? It's, it's uh, never an easy question for anyone at any, any company because it, it's, it's dependent on so many different issues. The way I look at it is, is you want to filter those, um, those options. And the, what I'm proposing is, is a dual track process that helps you to filter to, to come to the right decision. So what is it? It's basically where you're running a, par a process in parallel of a funding round and a sale of, of the company. You're not saying that you actually have to do either of them, um, but it's a way of, of seeing what your business is worth. So with funding, you know, you're going to talk to venture capital, private equity, strategic investors. If you're going to do an IPO, then you're going to go talk to institutional investors. Um, you, you could be looking to sell primary shares where the company's actually issuing shares, or you could be selling secondary shares where your shareholders are selling some shares. And you know, if you're just throwing out so much cash flow that you just don't need any cash, then you can always go down the secondary route so your shareholders can get some liquidity. Sales, 100% exit is strategic financial acquires. If you're going to go do any acquisitions or joint ventures, that's a, that's a sort of separate decision for you to pursue because that isn't for everybody. Not everyone wants to do acquisitions or is ready to do them because you really need a team, internal team, to integrate that post deal. So why do it? You're going to maximize value and flexibility. The reality is, is you have a higher probability of achieving liquidity in a single transaction at a higher valuation, which is obviously more appealing to shareholders and it's going to increase significantly the likelihood of, of getting a, an exit. And you always have the option to, to not move forward. But there's actual statistics showing that companies that pursue this get 22 to 26 percent premium when they get to a sale uh, versus not doing a dual track. And for people that are doing an IPO and then an M&A, um, 18 to 20 percent premium. 
Other reasons to consider it. The reality is, is if you are doing a fu fundraising or you're going to do a sale, you know, a lot of the elements are the same. You know, you're going to have to do an info memo, you're going to have to have a financial model, you're going to have to have a management presentation, you have a teaser, due diligence materials, and in many cases, use an advisor. Um, so why do that twice when you can just sort of do once and just talk to different people? It increases your optionality, so you've got more people at the table, which will give you more leverage and negotiation point. Because the aim here is to get multiple offers, offers from everybody so that you can really dictate the terms uh, that you want, wh whether it ends up being a sale or funding round. But, you know, one size doesn't fit all. You know, it's not for everybody. You know, you have to look internally at do you have the resources? You know, is the company growing appropriately? And do you have a big enough vision to, to sort of go down this route? Keep in mind, a sale process doesn't always lead to a sale. A funding process doesn't always lead to funding. Doing both together increases the odds in your favor. So I'm going to throw out a few sample deals, just to sort of throw out some insight. Company A, this is a company now that's doing about $15 million a year. They're very profitable, $8 million EBITDA. They don't need any cash. They're growing about 35% a year. They've got two shareholders. So it's, it's, it's a pretty simple company, but very profitable. They go down a dual track. An investor says, you know, they're going to give them a $72 million valuation, they're going to buy, and they're willing to buy 40% of uh, the founder's shares. Acquire only gives up a $50 million valuation, of which that's going to be 75% cash and, and the other balance and the earn out over three years. How do you decide between that? You know, it's, it's really, it's, it's difficult. But at the end of the day, these are two great options to have as opposed to just having one option. So the more options that you have, the better. But, you know, the, the other way to put it is, is that, you know, essentially with the investor deal, you know, you're looking at about $30 million in cash, you retain 60% control of the company. The other route, you're giving out complete independence uh, for $50 million and you have to work very hard for three years to get the balance. Well, actually, it's 75% of, of 50, so you're, you're looking at about just over $30 million uh, in cash, and then you have to work hard for the rest. So on a cash basis, it's not a huge amount of difference, but with the investor deal, you're only giving up 40%. A different um, deal, Company B, they're doing $10 million in revenue. They're not as profitable, $2 million EBITDA, they want growth capital. They're growing faster, 50% a year. They've, already, they've got three founders and they've already got a VC in there. It came in a $10 million pre-money valuation. So they go out, best offers at the table. Investor will put in $10 million at a $50 million pre-money. $3 million of that goes to founders and $7 million into the company. The acquirer you know, was willing to pay $40 million, 80% in cash, for your earn out in 20%. Um, so keeping in mind that the VC came in at 10 million pre-money um, and you probably wouldn't have a huge amount of control issues, so if the founders wanted to take this deal, they, they, wouldn't, be able, they wouldn't be held back by the VC, assuming that they, they did their first VC deal appropriately. But you know, essentially they would be getting $3 million off the table and they'd be, have $7 million to keep growing the company. If they're comfortable with the risk, then, then why not do that? The acquisition route, uh, the founders and the VC would be sharing $32 million up front and then having to work hard for another eight over four years. So I've got some statistics here to share with you um, that come from a survey done in September 2012 on dual track. So what do you expect will happen to the number of company sales using a, dual, using a dual track process in the next 12 months. 73% of people feel that that number is going to go up. Basically, more, they think, more people think that more people are going to use dual tracks. Next one is, what do you expect will happen to the price of companies for sale with a concurrent IPO? 53% think it's, they will end up getting a premium. 
Under current market conditions, do you believe a dual track process will maximize the price obtained in a sale? Sixty percent said yes. Finally, what will be the most common outcome of a dual track process over the next 12 months? Ninety-three percent say sale prior to IPO. So a lot of people are, seem to favor a dual track. So the best public example of a dual track is PopCap. Um, so just going back to over the press from 2011, there was first uh, some press about them getting ready for an IPO in January 2011. That was on um, allthingsd.com. Then Reuters had an exclusive that they were going to file an IPO by the end of the summer in April. Then PopCap acquired Zip Zap Play, which was a small competitor, end of April. Um, Wall Street Journal has an article in June that, you know, Pop Cat's playing an IPO while playing the field. Basically, they probably heard some rumors that there was lots of discussions going on. And then, in, you know, literally two and a half weeks later, they were it was announced that they were acquired by EA for as much as $1.3 billion. Um, and so a quote from a, the investor in Pop Cat from Maritech Capital Partners he said that recent IPO euphoria was a factor. Basically, they were able to use the potential IPO filing to really push up the demand for their company because there was rumored that was various other potential buyers and push up the value. And they did a great job with that. Um, so timing's everything. They raised 22 and a half million in VC round in October 2009. They did 100 million in revenue in 2010. And then they planned out their strategy for 2011. And PR was a very important part of that. They did all this PR around their IPO plans, which was basically work for sale. They did a small acquisition, which was another PR event. So readiness. You, you should have most of this stuff already ready in your company. You get, you've got to have one great game. You've got to have more than one game in your future pipeline. You should be generating at least $5 million, if not more. And you've got to be growing 30% you know, plus a year. And you've and you got to be profitable. Your management team should be in place. You should have good relationships with the key platform holders, whichever platforms that you're on, whether it's you know, Xbox Live or Apple iOS or Android from Google. You know, your games get featured. Your business, whatever it is, has to be scalable. And your metrics should be growing and strong. Basically, you want to be, have a very defendable business when you go out to talk to people who are going to have a lot of hard questions. So I'm not going to go into detail all about this chart, but you know, this presentation and video will be, will be made available by Casual Connect uh, within 24 hours. And this is just sort of maps out how to look at it from you know, the initial strategy on your left all the way to completion on your right. And there's just, you know, there's a lot of things that do, you can see that most of the stuff is in under process planning and preparation. If you prepare well, you really think about all the issues, you know, you have a higher probability of, of success. And there's a lot of things to do. Um, so make sure, you know, if you're going to do it yourself, you've got a, a great a uh, lawyer who's been there, done it before. Or if you get an advisor, someone who's been there and done it before. So if you're going to go out and talk to buyers, here's the primary ones you, you want to put on your list, put in what your company does. You know, I've covered everything from, you know, EAs of the world to, you know, Googles and Amazon. And these are all the ones that are, are open to the possibilities. You know, in terms of game companies, this is an interesting chart. On a market cap basis, these are the top 10 companies in the world. You're looking at about $122 billion worth of market cap value, which is 76% of all the public companies, and there's a lot more public companies. The interesting stat, if you take Tencent on your left, um, their value is bigger than the next nine combined. That's how big they are, um, and they keep getting bigger. Valuation considerations, you know, 
any buyer or investor is going to sort of balance out your success to take in your market position versus your challenges of how you're going to diversify your revenue and have a long-term sustainable business. So in growth-wise, they're going to look at your team, your organization's ability to scale, market share, and then your game pipeline and your ability to grow that profit. You know, what's going to drive profit in the next two, three years? Execution risk. If you go to do something, you know, there's always a possibility that, you know, the news is going to leak. Be prepared for that. A key team member could leave or get very sick. You know, your a key game might get delayed. You know, you don't hit your projections. You know, the economy goes down. But most important, once you term sheet sign for a deal, don't do anything that's going to has the potential to mess up any part of the business. Because um, I've seen that happen before, and it's 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 just really disappointing. Just focus on closing the deal, and you just push everybody, the other side, lawyers, your lawyers, to get the deal done, and then you know, go execute the plan, and then do a press release. That's it. That's my contact info. Uh, Casual Connect should be making the presentation available, and I'll have it on our website. Uh, in the next day or two as, as well. Any questions? Questions? It seems so simple, really, when you explained it. Well, mind you, I, I was running through it in about 20 minutes. You know, when I had these discussions... Well, it's not simple, but easy. It was like, and then you do this, and then you do that, and then you close know, the deal, and then you become a multimillionaire, and everything's good. When I, I, I discuss this one-on-one -on -one with a management team, it usually turns into about two or three hours in terms of discussion and questions about what about this, what about that, and, you know, potential valuation is obviously a big issue in everyone's mind is, you know, what do you think we'll end up with? Um, and I, I didn't even go there because I just don't have the time to talk about it today. And just so I, I, something that I'm not unclear on, what is your role typically in these discussions? You're an advisor? Yeah, I, uh, I've been advising game companies since 99 on M&A and funding. It's a rare opportunity to get, a, get some time with Paul. Any questions before we let him go? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.